Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers and sisters and viewers and friends of Ikra TV. Welcome back to the second part of Real Talk. I'm your host, Iqbal Bana. I'm deep, deeply grateful for you to be here. I even, I'm even more grateful to have my guest with me today, uh, a man who's not a stranger to many of you, and particularly not a stranger to people living in the Yorkshire region, but also nationally as well in the UK, and internationally to, to a large extent. Uh, Ishtiaq Ahmed, a dear friend of mine, uh, who has been working around equality, social justice, interfaith relationship, and bring, bringing faith communities together. But much more importantly, also, his work around the Council of Mosque in Bradford. As I said at the top of the program, the Council of Mosque in Bradford is an institution that has res commanded respect at major policy level in government departments because they've showcased how Muslim communities can come together and work together for the benefit of all faith organizations, but in particular for the Muslim faith organizations as well. Now we spoke about his life, his journey, how he started, where he started, he came here very young, uh, as an 11-year-old from Pakistan in 1967, and you know how he's moved up and progressed uh, to this age, this ripe old age, still looking extremely young uh, compared to you know many other people, and especially like me. Uh, and his, his the phenomenal amount of work he's done, uh, we could not encapsulate that in an hour's program. Probably would probably need to do three or four hours. But I mean, one of the the, the success of his uh, achievement and his work and his commitment and dedication is the Council of Mosque in Bradford. And as I said, that was one of the major factors of why the future king and queen of this country, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, when they visited Bradford last year uh, before the pandemic, they wanted to come and see the work that was happening because it was brings faith communities and non-faith communities together uh, in an environment where people feel safe and you know, in, a, in, a, in an area where they can communicate and talk to each other without being threatened. But Ishtiak, I mean, we talked about some of the other work. Can I just for a minute look at the Council of Mosques? Because as I say, it's a, it's a phenomenal development. It became a role model for others to follow. And after the establishment of the Council of Mosques in Bradford, you know, we now have Council of Mosques across the country. But you were the first. Now that must have been a huge task because we, divide ourselves so much that sometimes we don't want to, we might be the brothers in name but when it comes to indoctrination about our our faith based uh, sort of you know uh, discipline then you know we are very much divided how in when did you start this discussion about setting up a council of mosque which brings people from different sort of denominations under one umbrella the formation of the Council of Mosques and then and, and, and the pre, uh, the preparatory work mm -hmm. uh, happened around uh, throughout uh, 1980. Right. Uh, almost one year of, of extensive consultation, uh, talking, discussions, uh, and uh, then in 1980, you must have been very young at that, that time, you know, still young. And our, our people, elderly people, don't look at you know, young people and say, Usko. So, how do you win the confidence? Uh, f my, I, I started working for uh, Bradford Council for Voluntary Services right. in 1978. That was right. my first paid, paid job. Right. Yeah. Uh, and my role was is, is to look at the look at community development uh, within within uh, uh, South Asian communities uh, because because I think the view was at that time uh, that the, the 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 voluntary community sector uh, within the South Asian community was was not that much developed mm. uh, so uh, the idea was is is to actually provide impetus for that. Uh, and then, whilst whilst I was doing that, uh, the discussions around formation of council mosques were also happening. Right. Uh, people, people like uh, uh, Omar Hayat Saab, who was the president of UK Islamic Mission, uh, Shirazum Saab, who was then uh, the secretary general of, of the Muslim Association, Harvard Street Masjid, mm -hmm. uh, Pir Maru Saab. And, and a number of other people from different denominations were actually uh, discussing. Uh, the background to that was uh, that there was a growing re uh, realization uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, the Muslim community in Bradford was also in transition. Mm. Yeah, from basically you know 60s and 70s was basically uh, men coming here for work. Towards the end of 70s, beginning of 80s, families were coming, children were coming, and and so. Uh, the concern was is that these children are actually attending the schools here. Uh, they have their religious needs, their cultural needs, mm. uh, and, and, and there's no one actually uh, who's lobbying for that or speaking for that. Uh, the Bradford Council at the same time also felt that they didn't know who to talk to within mm -hmm. the Muslim community. So these two things came together and, and discussions was that uh, maybe uh, in terms of religious needs, of the, of the Muslim children in schools, massages were probably best placed uh, in terms of leadership to be able to actually enter into some kind of dialogue. Mm. Yeah, and and realization was is that if they were, if they were to speak together with a collective voice, uh, that then then the chances are that they will be able to make some kind of impact. Yeah, right. uh, so that was kind of almost background uh, to the formation of the council mosque. Uh, and then in 1981, uh, uh, leadership from all different denominations uh, within the within the House of Islam uh, agreed to, to to establish uh, a council of mosque uh, as a collective organization. Well, uh, to that in itself was a major, I'm sure, a major achievement. Absolutely, uh, incredible, phenomenal mm -hmm. achievement. And yes. I, I, you know, I, I, I used to say is, is that it's the only organization of its kind anywhere in the world. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, uh, the, the the template for Council of Mars was unique, uh, and remained unique for many many years mm. uh, until other Council of Mars actually. Uh, so, uh, Council of Mars has, has achieved m much over the years. Mm. But if, if if you dismiss everything else, uh, the most important and phenomenal achievement of Council of Mars has been that it has kept the different denomination. The, diff the leaders of the Muslim community together, mm. talking together, meeting together, discussing things, and planning uh, together and representing the uh, Muslim community, uh, something. And I think that's a phenomenal achievement over the oh, 40 definitely. years. Over yeah. the 40 years, yeah? yeah. The other thing that most people probably don't know, the Council of Mosque then became very instrumental in the establishment of, uh, establishment of Muslim Council for Britain. Mm. Oh, I see. Yeah, very few people, people know that the constitution of Muslim Council of Britain was actually initially agreed mm -hmm. at the Khidmat Center. All right. Okay, only a uh, uh, few yards down this where we are sitting now. Yes. At the, on the Manchester. That's where the, 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 the leadership of the Muslim community nationally met and agreed mm -hmm. the framework for the uh, constitution for the. Oh, even I didn't know that. Yeah, Muslim Council of Britain. Yeah. Okay, and then you know the Council, Muslim Council meeting was actually uh, inaugurated in London. Uh, see, so both myself and and, and Shirazam, uh, along with Yusuf Islam, mm -hmm. uh, were very much instrumental in working, supporting Iqbal Sakrani and a number of others to actually form Muslim Council of Britain. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's something. So that, that you know, that's, that, that's an enormous contribution. Well, definitely. Uh, of, of, of our council. So I think Council Mass actually played a very fundamental role in actually bringing our community together, holding it together. Mm. Okay. And 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 then you know the rest is the uh, rest is history. I mean, certainly you know, as I said, the Council of Mosque in Bradford is a role model for many other little, little towns and cities where councils of mosque have been established, but. As we know, you know, let's be honest with ourselves, we know in our own community, sometimes we are our worst enemies. Instead of working together, we work against each other. And that's why what happened in Bradford was a, a perfect anecdote to some of the ch challenges that we were facing. Now, and the, one of the examples of that was when the pandemic actually hit um, this country, the Council of Mosques, I remember when I did my first program on the pandemic, the two guests that I had, Dr. Tahir Shaheen, who was here on that day, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, so Mona Hayasa was here on that day as well, because we were talking about the impact of the pandemic and how it's, you know, it's going to affect the community and what we needed to do. They left the studio and went straight to the meeting of the Council of Mosque, and I think the very next day the Council of Mosque issued the guidance on what the Muslim, mosque, Muslim community needs to do. And you were very forthright 
in what the community needed to do in terms of shutting down the mosque, etc., because you know the safety of the the musallis and the community was very important. And to do that from all the different you know denominations coming together and each and every one of them agreeing collectively that that was the way forward, to me, is a massive achievement in this country. Now, I don't know whether you see that or not, but from the outside, I think that was a phenomenal achievement. And, you know, and that then was taken up by other, other communities as well, other towns and cities. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was very important mm. uh, decision, a very difficult decision for the council sure. was, was to take. Uh, and it, it, it happened as a result uh, uh, or following a long process of consultation uh, within our Muslim community. Mm. And we have, to, we have to consult and take on board advice and suggestions from our uh, Islamic scholars. Uh, you know, one thing I, always, I, I, I must say is that often we are very dismissive of our, uh, of our Islamic scholars mm. and Imams. Yeah? Uh, uh, well, my experience has been uh, throughout the 42 years that I have worked, and the 40 years that I have worked uh, with the Council of Mars, that whenever we called upon our Islamic scholars for a decision and for guidance, mm. they have been extremely most wise and most forthright. Mm. Yeah? They have never shied away from making, uh, making difficult decisions. Okay? And, and well, decision how, how do you deal with some of our ulema, unfortunately, in my view? Uh, very fixed and indoctrinated about their uh, sort of interpretation of certain issues, and therefore, you know, they will say, "No, nope, this is how it should be done," and that is that competition but I, interpretation. But I have not found that. Right. Yeah, I have not found that. Okay. Mm. Uh, just, uh, whenever we have actually went to ulamas, and 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 they met in shura, they met in consultation, uh, thought through the issues, uh, eventually. Uh, uh, we achieved consensus. Right. Yeah. I can't remember a occasion uh, throughout the 40 years of Council of Mars where ulamas from different denominations went in di different directions. Right. Subhanallah. They started off in, from different yes, directions, yes. That's but then I mean. they converged. They converged. Mm. Okay. And they converged because through the consultations and as a result. And I think that's important to, to, to realize. It's a dialogue, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. And we, we had some very difficult issues, uh, you know, throughout the 40 years. You know, we, uh, the, the issue around halal meat and provision of halal meat. Then we had honey food affair. Mm. Then we had rushti affair. Uh, the, the, the Gulf War, mm. uh, uh, you know, one after the other, you know, there's a whole kind of sequence of, of very difficult issues. Yes. And most recently, one of the issues that, that the ulamas had to face was, uh, was the, uh, the, the, the kind of development by a Muslim, Brafra Muslim Women's Council uh, of uh, a masjid, a mosque mm. by women. Okay. For women, by women. Uh, yeah, by women. Mm. The ulamas looked at that issue. Uh, and came up with a, uh, a really a very creative and positive way forward. And th what they said was that it is actually anyone within the Muslim community can establish a mosque. Mm. As long as you do it within the framework and the requirement of Sharia. Mm. Okay? Uh, uh, something. And then they, give, they gave that as guidance. When we came to COVID, uh, you know, we could not imagine that our ulamas will ever take a decision to say we are going to shut and close. Exactly. Service. That's what I mean, yes. Okay? Exactly. They took that decision. And their reference point was actually the life of the Prophet. Prophet sallallahu the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Okay? They went back in history. Yeah, say something. They actually uh, came up with those references and they made a decision that saving life is more important. Is more important. Yes. Okay, and it is as, is, is essentially about the, what the teaching of Islam is all about mm. is to keep keep our lives and our our sisters and brothers and children safe. And mm. I think that was the uh, the fundamental uh, kind of reasoning for that decision. But it was a difficult decision. It was made collectively, but not only made collectively, actually it was applied. Yes. Okay. There was hundred percent compliance. Mm. Across yeah. all the I know there were dissenting voices in the community. Always, which always, always going to happen. Well, always, but always, because the ulama had made that decision. Yeah, you know, people yeah. respected it. I mean, we got something like 130 mudalas and musajis yeah. in Bradford. Okay, hundreds of ulamas 
scholars mm. uh, with all kind of mindsets yeah certain differences are inevitable mm. and they should be there yeah but the fact of the matter is the senior ruler and scholars from each of nominations okay, always have delivered for us mm. in consensus and actually provided that leadership okay and that to me that has given me motivation mm. and that has given me inspiration and hope for the I'm future. sure it's inspired you you know and sort of inspired you and empowered you as well. absolutely because you know that sort of commitment and dedication mm. and bringing this disparate sort of group of people together and getting an outcome like that must be really something that you know is a major achievement well it's a blessing I, you know definitely. i always say it's a blessing for allowed me that i have been part of that journey definitely def have you never been sort of interested in becoming a a councillor or a member of parliament uh, i have been asked I'm many, sure many times i'm sure you have i'm sure you have uh, I have been offered opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt that uh, what I was doing was important. Uh, my focus was uh, that uh, focus was to do whatever I could do mm. uh, to to push and take my community forward. Uh, and, 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 something, and I felt that what I was doing was probably more important than for me to become elected member. Mm. Uh, and you know, when I look back, uh, I have no regret that I made a right decision, mm. uh, and I think I've been absolutely privileged to be working and with a lot of people. How important has been your family in supporting and helping you to do what you've been doing? I could not have done anything without the support of my wife. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are, you know we got married in in nineteen nineteen eighty. In fact, I got married on, on, on the Christmas day, oh, okay. 25th of, of December. So you have uh, double celebration. Yeah, 1980, absolutely. And, yeah, which is, if nothing else, it has helped me to remember our... Uh, <laughs> uh, our, our There's our, no our, way you can forget that. Yeah, our, our wedding date, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have, you know, a wonderful five, 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 five children, Masha three sons Masha. and two daughters. Uh, four of them married. They all professional. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Uh, they are all independent. They're doing extremely well. Uh, I've got nine grandchildren. Subhanallah. Uh, and and uh, I still look young. So yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. I mean, can't definitely. complain. Can't complain. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we there's a lot more to explore about Ishtiak's work and life that you know we could do, but we don't have enough time. I hope what you've heard, just a, a snippet of Ishtiak's life and work has inspired you. I mean, all it, that remains for me to, to do is to say, Ishtiak, I salute you for all the work that you've done. I mean, you have given inspiration to many, many people, not just in Bradford, but across the nation as well. And I know your work has influenced government policy at a national level and still continues to do that because I know that you know they still listen and read your articles and the Council of Mosques responses to many, many sort of proposals that the government puts out. Shiak, may Allah give you desire, care, and reward, not just in this world, but in the Akira and your family. I hope you found that inspiration. Inshallah, we'll come back to his life because there's much, much more to cover. I'll see you next week, Inshallah. In the meantime, take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.